you know, we, yeah, we can go ahead and get started since it's eight. Um, I have to just exit this thumbnail thing so I don't see everybody's boxes when I'm on the screen. Um, yeah, so as I said, yeah, my name is Stephanie. Um, you guys can call me Stephanie, Steph, whatever, if you have to say my name. Um, I'm an M4, so I'm applying um, to residency programs this um, August. I'm applying internal medicine. Um, I also really love neurology too. I liked everything, which is why I'm applying internal medicine. Um, but yeah, I go to Carver College of Medicine in Iowa City, um, and I'm just joining now this Motivate MD team. So I have a little more time during this fourth year, and I'm really excited to um, kind of do some work uh, with the team and things like that. So without further ado, we will begin with our case presentation. And everybody, let me know if um, you guys don't have access to the link for like the soap note, it should be in the chat right now. Um, but if not, just let me know. And here's a cheesy like joke. <laughs> okay. Um, so for those of you who haven't been here, um, we're just going to go through a case, um, talk about like physical exam findings, the differential assessment and plan, and pretty much do a little bit of teaching as well um, about the pathology of the disease. Um, hopefully we have enough time for that in this session for neurology specifically, because I think that that will be the bulk of it. Um, learning some of the neuroanatomy behind um, this disease presentation is going to be really cool. Um, so you can feel free to fill out the soap note throughout the presentation, um, and then there will be a quiz um, if you would like to take that at the end. Okay, so yep, like I said. All right, and we already talked about this, so that's cool. Um, yeah, we can just... I guess we could skip that since everybody kind of put that in the chat. Okay, so let's get started with our case. Okay, so uh, does anybody want to read this out loud? Any volunteers? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Thank you so much. <laughs> You are working in the emergency department when a 37-year-old male cyclist presents with a headache, weakness of the left arm and leg, and neck pain following an accident during his morning ride. A fellow cyclist witnessed the accident. The patient was going downhill at around 30 miles per hour when he hit a rock and was thrown off his bike. He was wearing a helmet but, his, but hit his head and lost consciousness. Consciousness was regained in uh, um, about one minute. EMS was promptly called and the patient arrived to the ED within 10 minutes of the accident. He has a cervical collar in place. Yep, so pretty much setting the scene for this. Um, we know it's a trauma patient, he was a cyclist. Um, what are a couple of things that stick out to you guys that you, know, you might be concerned about with this presentation? Like what with the event or the trauma that happened, what parts of it are you kind of concerned about? And anyone can answer otherwise put it in the chat or we could just talk yeah yeah lost consciousness exactly you know that's a little concerning but no yeah exactly does he know where he is is he aware right now like what is he back is he back to normal presentation um his normal cognition single side weakness yes wonderful that's a little concerning as well um anything else We also know he hit his head, right? Yeah, the headache, exactly. Yep, the headache's a little concerning, especially because he had that trauma to the head. So yeah, all, all great things. We are a little concerned about this patient, um, specifically um, neurologically speaking. Um, yeah, questions to consider, and you guys already mentioned some of these. So what else do you want to know from this? Past medical history, of course, yeah, wonderful. Definitely wanna know if he has any past um, history risk factors for things like stroke. Yeah, if he's other, other uh, symptoms he he's having, physical exam findings, yes, if his senses are working properly, cranial nerves, cranial nerves is huge, yes, that's great. Um, anything else?
All right. Well, you guys did wonderful. And I just add, I just added specifically some of the history questions. So not like physical exam stuff, but like other like questions about his symptoms. So like, is he having any pain? Is the pain severe anywhere specifically or localizing? Um, is there any evidence of external or internal bleeding? So this session isn't going to be related to trauma, really, we're going to be talking about neurological symptoms and neurology, but in any trauma patient, obviously, the first things you do are like the ABCs, you know, airway, um, breathing, circulation. Um, so obviously, looking for bleeding is important. Any evidence of fractures, um, and then any focal neurological signs. So again, you guys touched on the, the leg weakness, um, needing to look at the cranial nerve tests, senses, all of that good stuff. Wonderful. Okay, so here's what he has as some additional symptoms. So he's got some low back pain, the headache, the neck pain. He's got weakness in the left leg. He has no nausea or vomiting, and there's no evidence of fractures and no external signs of bleeding. Yeah, so all of these are kind of some alarm signs, I think is what is, Adrika, am I saying that um, properly? Oh, type in your document. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, wonderful. So let's go on to no nausea is usually good, right? Um, yeah, no, no, great question. Um, I think, you know, good versus bad is, is kind of difficult and um, kind of abstract. Um, obviously not having nausea, not puking um, is usually a better sign, right? Because if he was like puking, if he had a bunch of nausea or things like that, maybe we could think there was like trauma to the bowels or something like that. Um, in this case, no nausea, you know, doesn't really tell us too much. Um, it's just something that we ask people if there's nausea or vomiting. Um, but in his case with a trauma patient, no nausea probably is better. Okay. Um, let's talk about his history. So um, y'all can read through this. I'll just read some of it um, out loud. So he has a history of hypertension. Um, it was diagnosed at age 28, but he's not on any medications currently. He also has a history of exercise-induced asthma for which he uses um, albuterol as needed. Um, and he also had an appendectomy at age 12 because he had acute appendicitis. Um, which to note nowadays, they don't always take out the appendix when you have appendicitis, um, which is just a side note. Family history, um, mom is perfectly healthy. His dad has some hypertension as well and high cholesterol, no siblings. Uh, we know that his grandma died at age 72 from a stroke. Um, his, his paternal grandfather is still alive and has dementia. And then his maternal grandparents just both died in a traumatic event um, or a tragedy. Uh, for social history, you know, he's a cyclist, um, no smoking at all, just drinks socially, lives in Iowa City, he teaches sociology at a community college, and he owns two dogs and is married. So is there anything that specifically sticks out to you guys knowing the patient presentation, which parts of the history you might connect to certain things or be a little concerned about? Dementia. Yeah, exactly. Exercise, asthma, dementia. Yeah, all of those are. The loss of the family is concerning. Yeah, so Stella, if you're wondering if you're willing to um, expand on that thought a little bit, I'm wondering what you mean by that. Oh, okay. Yeah, acute stroke, exactly. Exercise, asthma. Yeah, because what is the risk factor for stroke, you guys, in this that he has? Mm -hmm. Right, he's got the hypertension, and maybe this is what uh, Phil meant by um, one of his grandparents died of a stroke before, so he's got the family history of stroke as well. So for the, seeing these, you know, neurological signs and also this um, positive family history and personal history, we might be a little more concerned about something like a stroke. Okay, great. Okay, physical exam. Um, 
I'm going to read through like a part and then you guys tell me like which if there's something concerning. Okay, so looks like the vitals. We've got a heart rate of 100 blood pressure 135 over 90 respiratory rate 18 SPO2 is 98. He's afebrile. Um, his weight is 80 kilograms and his BMI is 26. Are there any parts of the vitals that you're um, that stick out to you or anything that you want to comment on? Heart rate, blood pressure. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, his heart rate's a little, I mean, a little tachycardic. Um, the blood pressure, interestingly, the 135 over 90, you know, for somebody that's has hypertension, not controlled on medications, that might be, um, that might be fine. Um, the thing, the reason I wanted to put in here that he's a little tachycardic and might have a little bit of elevated blood pressure is because we think of trauma situations. Um, a lot of times we think of be people being hypotensive, like their blood pressure is low, um, especially if they're bleeding out or there's any sort of internal injuries that we can't see taking place. Um, but in this guy, it's certainly possible that he could have some sympathetic um, overdrive right now because with trauma and things like that, your sympathetic nervous system kind of, you know, ramps up a little bit. So that could be why his blood pressure is elevated. Um, additionally, because he does have that history of hypertension. Good, wonderful. So general, he appears anxious and he's only in mild acute distress. He's got the C collar in place and he's well nourished. Um, for head and neck, he's got normal head. Um, there's no obvious trauma or deformity of the skull. Pupils are equal round reactive to light and his mucosa is mildly dry. Um, cardiopulmonary, he has regular rate and rhythm, no murmurs, rubs or gallops and his lungs are clear to auscultation. He's breathing a little quickly, just to, what to Kipnik means. Um, on MSK exam, no obvious fractures. Abdominal is um, soft, a little bit tender, but no hepatosplenomegaly, so the liver and the spleen are not enlarged and no guarding or rigidity. Why is the abdominal exam like specifically important in trauma? Yeah, spine is, that's, yeah, exactly. Internal bleeding because of the spine, yeah. So yeah, MSK, the spine, that can all clue us into like neurological signs too, can also clue us into things with the spine. Um, yeah, specifically like internal bleeding um, and fluid in the abdomen is definitely important. That's why, you know, the first thing that we do when we have trauma patients, um, you'll hear about what the, the FAST exam is, is where they really take the ultrasound and they can look and see if there's um, fluid going on, if there's bleeding going on internally, um, because that signals to us that this is like an emergency, right? Um, cause a lot of times when people come in and they've got like really, really severe abdominal pain and like the way that their abdomen looks and any bruising, things like that, that can clue us into like internal bleeding taking place that we can't necessarily see, um, on initial presentation on the outside. Okay, and then the skin, he just has like a small laceration on the lower area of the posterior neck. Okay, all right. So neuro exam, this is like the more beefy part of this. Um, it looks like for mental status, um, somebody said they were wanting to know about, you know, what's his cognition like? Is he with it since he lost some consciousness? Um, it says he's alert and oriented times three, speech is fluid and clear. He can follow commands, naming and repetition and text. So it seems like things are pretty good from a mental uh, status standpoint. Cranial nerves, um, seems like things are pretty good there as well. All of those are intact. Um, motor, we have some significant findings though. Um, right upper extremity and the right lower extremity, we can lift it against gravity without drift. Um, left upper extremity, he has some weakness on, re on reflexes, um, or on extension and flexion. Um, and then his left lower extremity, he has weakness in raising the left leg. So does anybody remember what side of, or which, was it left or right that he had um, leg weakness? Left, okay. So that's important to keep in mind. So let's remember that he came in and he says, uh, you know, my left leg feels weak. My left arm feels a little weak. And on exam, we see that that is true. That's also what we're seeing is that his left arm and his left leg are a little weak and deep. So we'll keep that in mind. Um, and then sensation. So we do, you know, two tests for sensation here with this, this gentleman. Um, we're going to be testing for like pain and temperature sensation. You can use that like using a little like um, 
what's the word to toothpick toothpick you can use that for like the pain part of that um for vibration you can use like a tuning fork and so that's what we do and it seems that above the neck he can feel pain temperature vibration everything like that but below the neck pain and temperature is decreased in the right extremities and tactile and vibration is decreased in the left okay so that's important to take note of so let's see a second okay yeah exactly so if somebody wants to you know either in the chat or wants to you know give a little bit of information maybe a summary statement about what we know so far uh summary statements are important a lot of times we do this as medical students um somebody coming into the emergency department or yeah absolutely you can go back for sure so because yeah i went i went through that a little fast <laughs> Um, but yeah, what I was saying is like, you know, a couple of sentences, a few sentences to tell your attending or tell your resident that you're working with, you know, what are the key points of what we know about this person or what we know about this case? What do I need to make sure that I relay, um, important facts that can prove or disprove certain differentials about what I think might be going on? Okay, are we good to go forward? And actually, you know, now that I think about it, let's just put, put that in the chat. So leg weakness on the left. Oh, it says mentally. Oh, oops. Sorry, everyone at meeting. Leg weakness on the left. And then he has loss of pain and temp on the right below neck. And he has loss of vibration on the left below. Okay, so does anybody want to give, try to give a summary statement, um, or just kind of either put in the chat, just even also just list some of the most important things we know about this case? Yeah, I am so sorry that when I made this, I was just I'm thinking in my head and then I'm just like writing, I shouldn't be writing um, acronyms. I apologize for that. Past medical history is PMH. Um, EMS is emergency med medical services. So usually when we do summary statements for, um, yeah, thank you, Phil. Um, usually when we do summary statements for, for patients, we start with saying, you know, this is a so-and-so year old, you know, male or female, he's got a past medical history of blah, blah, blah. He comes in because he has this, you know, um, what are the pertinent symptoms that he's having? He's complaining of, you know, leg weakness or whatever. Um, and here are some pertinent physical exam findings. Yeah. So Adam, so Adam says, so basically loss of nociception on the right and loss of tactile sensation on the left. Absolutely. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. No susception, pain and temperature, tactile sensation, vibration, position sense on the left. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. So let's just go forward with this. So really what I would say, um, oops, really what I would say is like, this is a 37 year old male. He's got a past medical history significant for hypertension without medications. Um, he presents to the ED following trauma, kind of description of the trauma is important, which kind of makes this presentation a little bit longer, um, just because it's important to note that he did lose consciousness, it's important to note that he did hit his head, um, the speed at which he was going, all of that is important. Um, and then also coming um, to the emergency department, the vitals were stable, that's important to note, um, his current symptoms, which we've talked about no obvious signs of bleedings or fractures, and then the physical exam, which we've also noted, which is the left arm and left leg weakness, the loss of vibration and tactile senses in the left extremities, and the loss of pain and temperature or no susception, as Adam pointed out, in the right extremities. And we also wanna note that cranial nerves are intact because that is also important. Okay, 
So let's talk through like maybe what could potentially be going on and also what are some of the alarming symptoms and physical exam findings now that we kind of have a bigger picture of, of this presentation. Leg weakness. Yes. And yes. Wonderful. So people are saying that loss of sensation. Yes. Damage the right hemisphere. Nicole, what do you mean by right hemisphere? Possible head bleed. Possible head bleed. Yes. Perfect. And so I think what Cole means by right hemisphere is like the right hemisphere of the brain. I was, yep. Wonderful. Yep. Great. So yeah, if everybody can see what Cole put in the chat, um, he still be noted that pain is localized to the left half of his body. So the right side of the brain would be responsible, which is true. Yes. Um, our right side of our brain kind of controls our left side of our body as well with motor and vice versa. Um, and we'll talk about some of those laterality symptoms um, as we move along in this case presentation. Wonderful, Adam. Yeah. So um, Adam says that the nature of the loss of sensation indicates a spinal cord issue, pain loss on right and tactile loss on left. So that's something very, very important to point out. So um, I think that's really great that you noticed that. Um, and basically the incongruency between like what side of the body things are on. Um, and we'll talk about why, but later um, we'll talk about if the issue is like higher up in the brain, usually the sensations will all be together. So the loss of sensation, the loss of motor will all be on the same side. I tutor biopsych, so I know the spinal test. Yeah, so you'll, this will be all review for you. Yeah, um, spinal paths, exactly. So, okay, wonderful job. You guys did a great job with that. So differential diagnosis, oh shoot. So we talked about the alarming symptoms. Tell me like, what are some possible things you're, that you think are going on? Somebody mentioned something in the spinal cord, which is great. Maybe something up higher in the brain, like in the hemisphere. Um, I think somebody mentioned stroke just in general. Um, anything else that could be going on with them? Nerve damage, yeah, great. A vertebral fracture, like one of the vertebrae are fractured or herniated. Yes, wonderful. Exactly, because that could cause what? Paralysis or loss of feeling. Exactly, yeah, not, not to put you on the spot, sorry about that. I meant more like, yes, that's great because those herniations or the fractures can damage the spinal cord, as you said, and then cause like paralysis or loss of feelings, compression of the cord, like Phil said. Great, yeah, I think all those are all um, some great differentials we have going on, especially just knowing the... Um, context, which is that he's undergone this trauma, right? So we can have a fraction, fracture potentially of the cervical spine. You know, he's got some neck pain. He had that trauma. He's got a little laceration there. Who knows what's that, that, what that is from. It could be from the rock or whatever. Um, you could have a herniated disc. Um, again, that can happen with trauma. That can also just happen when you're, you know, outside working in the yard or even when you're sitting, you can herniate your disc. Um, stroke, um, we can have a transection of a blood vessel from trauma to the head. So again, kind of going back to um, what somebody said about like the hemisphere, we could potentially have like a stroke or a bleed in one of the hemispheres. Um, going along that line, um, we could have a hematoma, just a brain bleed from the trauma um, in our brain. And then we could have transections of the spinal cord. So um, that could be from the fracture or from a herniated disc. Um, something less likely is like a tumor um, only because he's presenting with neurological signs. Maybe he has some slow growing tumor that, you know, eventually it, he's starting to have some, some signs and what caused him to get off balance. Maybe that caused him to have the fall. Um, and then you find that and it's, you know, localizing to these certain neurological signs, but that's a lot less likely. So we pretty much got all the differentials. Great. All right. So assessment and plan. So we're going to ignore the first steps in a trauma patient. Like I said, we're mo mostly focusing on like the neurological issues in this case um, session. Because if, you know, this patient was a normal trauma patient, and, or if we go, we're going through the trauma workup, we'd talk about like ABCs, the fast, you know, putting in IVs, if he's bleeding, that sort of thing. Um, but that's not what we're focusing on. So we're focusing on, let's say like this guy comes in, he has trauma, and now he has these acute neurological issues. 
the first thing we want to do is get a non-contrast CT scan. The reason we want to do this is because we know he hit his head. We know he lost consciousness. We know he has neurological signs. So we are concerned that there's bleeding going on in his brain, right? This can help us rule out a hematoma, which is bleeding in the brain from like basically bursting of the blood vessels or like some sort of stroke because the contract, uh, the blood will show up as bright on the CT scan when you do it with non-contrast. So you can know if there's an acute bleed. Additionally, we'd want to do something like an x-ray of his cervical spine, um, which in this patient, um, the non-contrast CT was negative and the cervical spine x-ray was positive for a fracture uh, of C7 on the left. So you guys were kind of um, on point with, with that possible fracture. All right, so my question then was, I, I'm kind of pausing here a minute because I'm like, why did I just write these questions and then write the answer and, and not give you guys time to think? Um, but does a cervical spine fracture explain his symptoms? And you can read what I said, but somebody, you know, tell me why we think that, you know, the cervical spine fracture does or doesn't explain his symptoms. Anything else you want to comment on with that? I guess you would say none of his other functions are affected, just his ability to sense and move. So that's likely an issue with the conduction of electrical signals, so likely his spinal cords. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. I think that's a great explanation. Yeah, that's perfect. I think, you know, if we just had the cervical spine fracture, you know, not everybody that fractures their cervical spine or fractures their lumbar spine or any sort of bone in their body is going to have damage to the spinal cord, right? That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have damage to the spinal cord. But the fact that he does have neurological symptoms, again, like, like you said, um, suggests that there's some sort of disruption of the electrical signals throughout the body. And that doesn't happen. You know, electrical signals don't travel through bones, right? They travel through the spinal cord. So something else must be going on. Either this is separate or the cervical spine fracture is causing the symptoms. Okay. Which will need an MRI, but we will take a break from this case for a second to talk a little bit about what's going on. So um, you guys were right on point of wondering, okay, well, here's what he's presenting with. Um, is this possibly something wrong with the spinal cord? And could this be a result of, you know, the spinal cord being injured because of the trauma and because of the fracture? So we're going to talk about this patient's specific presentation. Um, and I'm, I sprinkled in a little bit of neuroanatomy too, um, so we can go through some of those three tracks, the basic neuro, neuroanatomy of the spinal cord to give you guys a little bit more context. Okay. So essentially what this guy has is brown saccard syndrome, which I don't like when they name things after people because that doesn't tell you anything, right? So it's just basically a hemisection of the spinal cord, right? So you can see on this side, it's completely out versus like, you know, on this side, it's completely damaged. And the reason we're concerned about this in this guy is because he has got that fracture at C7 causing, you know, a potential loss on uh, the left side of his spinal cord at that level. So the most common cause of this, of causing that hemisection is actually trauma. So um, knife wounds, knife wounds specifically are the most common cause. Um, gunshot wounds as well can cause this. And basically the presentation is weakness or loss of motor function on the same side of the lesion. So again, remember he had that left leg weakness. Um, and then for sensory, we've got pain and temperature sense loss on the contralateral side, which again, I remember he has um, the right side has a loss of pain and temperature. And then the vibration sense um, or the proprioception is loss on the same side of the body. So does that kind of make sense for like, I guess just getting it down in general is we've got a hemisection of a spinal cord. We're gonna suspect that motor function is going to be compromised on the same side, pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side and vibration sense on the same side. But why is that so? Okay, I kind of already talked about this. So yeah, to understand the laterality and why these symptoms are presenting, then we're going to review the neuroanatomy. Okay, 
So just going basic, because I think like when we talk about, and I wish I could do like an entire like neuroanatomy, like lecture, like specifically on, you know, neuroanatomy versus the like case presentation too, because I think it's like really cool. It's one of my favorite things to talk about, but it does take a while to learn. So we're really just going through the basics. But I think before you start going through the basics or diving deep, either or, you have to go back to very basic like neuron structure because that just makes everything so much simpler. So when we talk about, you know, we're talking about motor and sensation right now in this guy. When we talk about motor and sensory neurons, we have to picture in our mind what those look like, what those do, how they connect, how they go to the brain, et cetera. So we'll talk about sensory neurons first. So sensory neurons, remember the cell body is outside of the central nervous system, all right? So it's got its two arms out, these two nerve endings. And this nerve ending is like receiving information, right? Receiving information about pain, temperature, vibration, tactile stimulation, et cetera. And it's sending that information down along the axon to the cell body, and we're then connecting to another neuron, so on and so forth, all the way up to the brain. On the contrary, motor neurons have their cell body inside the CNS. So inside the spinal cord, specifically in the gray matter. So what the, what the motor neurons do is they're sending information from the brain to the body, to the muscles, telling it what to do. So the information is coming down this way from the brain versus the sensory, which just comes from your body up to the brain, right? So we go down from the brain to the cell body, eventually leaves the spinal cord and goes out and acts on, you know, different muscles. And the reason I like to show this picture and stuff is because, um, or pictures like this, is because axons, when they're bundled together in the spinal cord, they're bundled together in um, things called tracts. Right? So all of the axons that are giving you pain and temperature sensation, for example, are all bundled together to form a little tract in the spinal cord, which we will see on uh, the next slide. So if you are having damage, for example, to a specific part of the spinal cord and you damage that tract, you're damaging all of those axons that are bringing that information from that part of your body. And there are you know, millions and millions of them bringing information, for example, like from your hand. Sorry, I'm like acting it out. <laughs> well, like you have like a ton and ton and ton of axons coming in to a specific part in uh, your spinal cord. So if that gets transection, transected, then you'll have damage to that. Sensory afferent, motor efferent. Yeah, great, wonderful. Um, Adam said sensory afferent with an A, motor efferent with an E, meaning the differences between body to brain, brain to body, that sort of thing. Motor would be efferent and sensory would be afferent. Yes. Okay, so let's talk about these tracks. And it's a little over, it can be a little overwhelming, like thinking about neuro first, especially if you like haven't learned it before. Um, my first time learning neuroanatomy was in medical school and it was like a lot, but you know, it takes a while to get used to, but we'll just, we'll focus on today. Um, just knowing the three tracks. I think that that would be, you know, fine for, for this lecture. And then also if you've never heard about it before, I think that that's wonderful if you're able to just pick up on these three things. So there are three major tracks in the spinal cord. There's the dorsal column medial limb discus tract. That track is lo located posterior in the spinal cord. So we see right here, this section, I'm sorry, I did do a good job of, of even explaining this, but this is a cross section of the spinal cord. Okay, so this is anterior right here, and this is posterior. So like this would be posterior towards your back, for example, anterior towards, you know, your belly button, that sort of thing. Um, this dorsal column medial lemniscus tract runs back here, right? It runs, well, this side as well, but it runs back here near the posterior side. And what it does is it houses the axons that carry information about vibration, tactile, position sense, et cetera, okay? So we have the dorsal column medial lemniscus tract. Then we have the spinothalamic tract. The spinothalamic tract is like anterolateral in the spinal cord. So it's, you know, bilateral as well. You know, it's this side and then there's one over here. Just the picture doesn't show it. Um, but this carries pain and temperature sets. Okay, so pain and temperature. And then our DCML is our vibration. Those are our two sensory tracts. And then we also have our cortical spinal tract, which carries motor function. And our cortical spinal tract is located here in the red. Okay, so it's kind of, oops. So it's kind of like more lateral, I guess I would say. So spinal thalamic, corticospinal, and dorsal column, okay? So now we know our three tracks, what they carry, kind of 
in general where they're located within the spinal cord. Well, we now need to talk about their paths because that gives us information about laterality. So for example, if I were to damage the spinal cord at this specific section, am I gonna be losing pain and temperature on my right side, on my left side? Am I gonna be losing you know, vibration sense on my left side, on my right side? You know, which is, what is what? And so to answer those questions, we have to know the, um, the course of the tracks. So pictures can be a little overwhelming, but let's talk about the corticospinal tract first. So that's on this left side of the screen. I believe you guys can see my mouse. Um, but essentially, uh, and I think it was Adam, I don't have the chat pulled up, but he was saying efferent um, is motor, um, which is completely true, right? Efferent is from the brain to the spinal cord. So essentially, I just want you to focus on the fact that we have these axons traveling in these tracks that are giving us information from the brain to our body what to do. What happens is these axons come together in this bundle and, oops, sorry, and at the bottom of the brainstem, so like lower on in your brain, at the bottom of your brainstem near the medulla, these cross. So for example, all of the axons that come from, you know, the right side of the body are going to be traveling to the left because somebody had mentioned too that the contralateral side, that your brain controls the contralateral side of your body, which is totally true, right? Um, controls left, left controls right. So all of these axons coming from, for example, the right side or the right hemisphere are going to cross at the level of the medulla and the lower brainstem, and they're gonna travel through the spinal cord on the opposite side to reach where they need to go. Same for this side. So if we imagine like we've got a bundle over here. They cross in the lower brainstem and then they go to the opposite side. Does that make sense a little bit, guys? It's okay if it doesn't, but I just didn't know if I was like explaining it. I'm trying to go fast. So, um, so what this means is in the spinal cord, we, if we have damage to one side, so for example, right versus left, if we have damage to the right side, we're gonna have right weakness, right? We're gonna have same side signs, okay? And why does that make sense? Well, if we imagine, so what, help, what helps me with laterality is just imagining like crossing out these tracks. So if I'm the corticospinal tract and I'm on this side, where did I come from? Well, I came from this same side in the spinal cord and I crossed higher up in the brainstem. But if you're telling me this section is damaged at a part below where it's already crossed, then it's ipsilateral. It's the same side. You're going to have symptoms on the same side. Does that make sense to everyone? Maybe a yes and no. I don't know. <laughs> um, yes. A little bit. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's helpful to like draw it out too, but I just, that, that's kind of the takeaway I wanted you guys to get from as far as like the basic science part of this is like how to localize, you know, knowing where a tract is, where it crosses and what side of the body you find symptoms on. So like if this was right damaged right here, right? We had it coming down and then it came all the, oh, and then it crossed and then it went over here. So this side is fine, right? This side of the body is fine this stuff that was coming over here is not. That's why it's on the same side because it's already crossed. Now, that's the corticospinal tract. This is the spinal thalamic tract, which again, we know um, carries pain and temperature sensation. So this is afferent, right? So from the body to the brain. So as soon as the spinal thalamic tract um, axons enter the spinal cord and form that tract, they immediately cross. Okay, so they immediately cross at that level and then they travel up. So right side of the body, you know, pain and temperature in my right arm or whatever, it's coming in, it's coming to the spinal cord and it's immediately crossing and traveling up the tract on the left side, okay? So at that level of the lesion, if we have a lesion at, you know, the right side, for example, the right side is receiving all of the axons from the left side. So since we're having that damage in the spinal cord, we are going to have loss of pain and temperature on the left side if it's a right side lesion. And again, that's just because the crossing takes place in the spinal cord. Whereas for the corticospinal tract, the crossing took place in the brain stuff. Okay. And then the last one we'll talk about is the dorsal column medial lemniscus. Again, this 
tells us about uh, vibration and position sense. Um, it also crosses in the brainstem. So that's different than our spinal thalamic tract. So what this means is that you'll have loss of vibration and position on the same side, right? Because it has not yet crossed. Any questions about this or anything that needs clarification? Okay, so back to our patient. Um, actually, let me not do this slide because I wanna ask and see if people are thinking what I'm thinking. Okay, so we know our patient has left leg weakness, right? So which cortic, what side of the corticospinal tract is damaged on our patient? Okay, so we're saying left, exactly. Yep, left. Um, and we'll talk through that again. So again, it's because the corticospinal tract comes from, so let's say, the right side of the brain, right? The right side of the brain, all these axons are traveling down and they're going towards the left side. They've already crossed by the time they reach the left side of the body. So if our left side is transect transected, then we have left leg weakness. It's all on the same side because those fibers have already crossed. Wonderful. So our guys also having um, pain and sensation loss um, in the right side of the body. So damaged the spinal thalamic tract. What side is the spinal thalamic tract damaged on? Yeah, so Mark is saying left, Phil is also saying left. Left, Arpita, yes. Great. Yeah, so it's also left, right? Because damage to the spinal thalamic tract causes contralateral symptoms. Again, I feel like this is a little ambitious to try to like actually like teach this stuff and like get a true, you know, understanding. But I feel like at this level, just with this case presentation and what, what I want you guys to glean from this is even just, you know, memorizing you know, what goes with what. So like corticospinal tract, if you're below the lesion or sorry, below the decussation of the tract, you're going to have symptoms on the same side. The spinal thalamic tract, pain and temperature, it's gonna be opposite. And then the DCML, which would be the last one with the vibration and position sense, um, he is having that issue on the left side. So which the tract is damaged on the left or the right for the DCML. So this would also be left. Yes, this would also be left. And let me go to this picture because this will explain it better. Actually, yeah, this picture will explain it better. So can everybody like, can everybody imagine that the DCML is right here? DCML is right here. Corticospinal tract is right here, or right here, sorry. And the spinal thalamic tract is right here, okay? So all of these, I'm telling you, in this guy, he had a hemi section of this part of the cord. So all of those tracks are out, right? All of them are out on the same side because he has a transaction to that same side of the spinal cord. So left side of the spinal cord is damaged for him. So what does that mean? That means left spinal thalamic tract is damaged, left DCML is damaged, left corticospinal tract is damaged. So we know that. And so we can say, what symptoms will he have then? They're all damaged on the left. All tracks are damaged on the left, but each of them will cause a different symptom. So having the corticospinal tract damaged on the left means that he's gonna have left weakness. Having the spinal thalamic tract damaged on the left means he's going to have right-sided pain and temperature loss. Having the DCML damaged on the left means he's going to have loss of pain, uh, sorry, loss of vibration on the left. So does that kind of make sense with the laterality? So they're all damaged at the same spot, but because of the way the tracks work and travel within the spinal cord, you're gonna have different symptoms, like on different sides of the body. And I think somebody mentioned earlier that 
in the spinal cord, if you have, you know, your pain and temperature and your vibration senses are on opposite sides of the body. So like, for example, that's what's going on with this guy. He has loss of pain and temperature on the right, and he has loss of vibration on the left. It's not congruent. That's how you know you're in the spinal cord and not the brainstem. Okay. Cause in the, by the time those two tracks reach the brainstem, they're closer together. So you were going and they've already crossed. So you will have the same side symptoms. So you'll have pain and temperature, vibration, all of that lost on the same side. Spinal cord, those are going to be different. Okay, so that also gives you a clue that this is this problem is within the spinal cord. Additionally, the cranial nerves are normal. Um, cranial nerve issues, like when, when it's up in the brainstem, when it's higher up and you have cranial nerve issues, that's how you know you're not in the spinal cord, that there's something going on in, in the brainstem because cranial nerves come off of their respective tracks in the brainstem, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this lecture. So what we wanna do with this guy is um, perform an MRI. MRI uh, confirms the pathology of uh, spinal cord injuries. Um, I am, this is beyond my scope. I am not a radiologist. I will say that I just got off like four weeks of a radiology elective. So, I mean, I should know. I didn't do a lot of neuro though. Um, but so I'm not sure if this is what ex specific, uh, weighted, you know, MRI, this is sometimes you know their T1, T2, sometimes they can do all of those special little tests, but regardless, you can see where this like lesion area will clue you into that they're, you know, the spinal cord injury. And over here, we can see on this side that it's also lighting up over here. And the reason I chose this image, I think it was, shoot, I forgot to tag the, um, the source. I think I might've put it at the end, but this is a brown Saccard syndrome that also kind of crossed over into the other side. So it's, it's important to remember that like learning the basics is really important because then, you know, like, okay, I know the physiology, I know the pathology, that sort of thing, but patients are never going to present, you know, so, so clear cut, right. They're never going to have just like weakness on this side, pain and temperature, this side vibration, this side, you know, it can be a ton of funky stuff, just depending on where in the spinal cord and at what part the, um, the lesion is, is taking place. Okay. So going back to like our actual case presentation and stuff. So what, what this guy did was when, when we, when he came in, we did the non-contrast CT, right? We wanted to make sure there was no bleed, wanted to make sure there was no hemorrhagic stroke. Um, we did the cervical x-ray, which showed us he had a fracture. And then we had, we did the MRI, which said, oh my gosh, this fracture is causing, um, is causing the brown Saccard syndrome. It's causing the lesion, um, the disruption of the spinal cord. So Really for brown Saccard syndrome, treatment is, is aimed at focusing on the underlying cause. So for our patient, this was trauma. So like cervical spine stabilization is important because we don't want him to further damage his board. So something to note too, is that his fracture was at C7. If it was at C6, you know, and, and that level was damaged. Can anyone tell me something we would be super concerned about if his fracture was at C6? I personally think probably paralysis or of some sort or like inability to move, like to speak or digest food. Yeah, no, great. Wonderful. Um, so we're still in the spinal cord here. So some of those like, um, you know, locked in type syndromes, like the more things like that would be higher up, but I think you're on, you're definitely on the right track with thinking like paralysis, paralysis specifically of like the diaphragm. I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, yeah, breathing. Yeah, breathing would be more difficult, Adam. Yeah, the diaphragm is innervated by the phrenic nerve, right, which is carried by C6. So exactly. So we're concerned that would be a big, you know, a big um, thing to be concerned about if somebody came in with that sort of damage. So you'd want to get respiratory on board, you probably have to start, you know, breathing for the patient, intubate them, etc. Um, so yeah, both of you are totally on track with that. Um, okay, so something we also do. <clears throat> and I don't know if we do it. I haven't done my ICU rotation yet. So I don't know if we do it at the university, probably, I'm not sure, but, um, is give high dose steroids. Um, I think that's controversial at its time, but previously it was like, you always gave someone high dose steroids when they came in with a spinal cord injury. And that's because steroids are anti-inflammatory. So it can help reduce some of the swelling, um, which is, you know, swelling is, is bad if that happens because then like the brain can herniate things like that. I can re reduce the extent of paralysis. Um, and then, like I said, respiratory and urological support may be needed. Urological specifically, if you get down to those several levels, 
Um, and then physical therapy and occupational therapy. All right, does anyone, so my sources, I guess I just linked a couple things here. I also wanna give special thanks to my neuroanatomy tutor um, because, or not tutor, my neuroanatomy professor, um, because a lot of like what I just know in my brain is from stuff that, you know, he taught us, he had wonderful slides and things like that. So, um, okay, you guys can take the quiz if you want. Um, do you, what sort of questions do you have? That was actually faster than I thought. Maybe I talked too fast. So maybe it was a little like overwhelming, but, um, I hope you gained something from it. Do you guys have any questions specifically about this case, neuroanatomy, neurology, med school, I don't know, anything, um, feel free to, we have, you know, a little bit of time. So um, I don't mind answering any questions. Someone raised their hand. Yes, yeah, I can just I, see that you raised your hand. <laughs> sorry, it's fine. I was just wondering, um, when it comes to using an MRI, do you have any suggestions on how to tell the location of the vertebrae where the fracture happened? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, sh uh, short answer from me, no. <laughs> but um, but long answer, um, I think if you looked at it like through, oops, sorry. If you looked at it like through here, I mean, an astute radiologist would probably be able to pick up the fracture, right? I mean, it's a bone, you can see where the bones are and you'd probably be able to see a break. Um, the MRI is, is needed mostly for the spinal cord um, imaging. Um, the fractures you should be able to see on the x-ray. In fact, I think those would those actually probably show them better than the MRI, um, just a plain film x-ray. But don't quote me on that. Can you also explain again which side damage would occur according to where the axons are located? Yeah, thank you. I'm really glad that you said that because I know this was so fast and I feel like not being able to jot out can be hard. So, and going so fast, um, I think it was a little lofty of me to just start talking about this stuff because, you know, the case presentation was kind of supposed to be the bulk of it, but it's hard not to, right? Because and then it's like, once you give a little bit, then it's hard. You almost have to give it all or you don't understand it. It's so I, I, it's probably very confusing and will be confusing until you take a neuroanatomy class, but I will try again to, we'll use the corticospinal tract as an example. So we're back to this picture, okay? So basically what happens is, let's say that this is, you know, cause I don't know what, what, what side of the body this is. Let's just say this is the right, okay? This is the right brain. The right brain wants to tell your left side of your body to move, okay? Cause right controls left, left brain controls right. So your right side of your brain is like, I wanna tell my left side of the body to move. How do I do that? Oh, I take all of my little neurons, I activate them and I'm sending all of the messages down their axons. So I send it down this little railway, essentially this little um, road, I guess, railroad down to the left side of the body. So what happens is all these axons travel together in a bundle, delivering this message. Their course is to go through the right side of the um, brain all the way down to the lower part of the brain with, within the brainstem, and that's where it crosses to the left side of the body. So they're all bundled together, traveling from this right side of the brain, the axons are, to the left side of the body. When they get to the brainstem, they cross over to the left. That's when they cross over to the left. And when they cross over to the left, they become this thing. Do you see this, the lateral cortical spinal tract? They become this bundle. So this bundle are all of these axons that came from the right side of your brain, and they came together, they crossed in the brainstem, and they came to this side instead. So they were on the right, now they're on the left in the spinal cord. Does that make sense a little bit more? Yeah, that makes sense. A little bit more, yeah. I know it's, it's hard to think about and it's, um, yeah, it's, it's easier if you, you know, you sit around, kind of mull over it a little bit, draw it out yourself. Um, drawing it out is helpful at learning like what type of symptoms you'd be having. So I think this is pretty easy to understand the fact that like the right side comes together, it's traveling in this little bundle, and then he's going to cross over to the other side by the time he gets to the, the spinal cord. But what's more difficult is saying, hey, if I X out this part of the spinal cord, what symptoms are you going to have? So if we use our example, though, we have our right side, right? And we're on the left now. Right side of the body controls, or sorry, right brain controls left side of the body, right? 
So if we X out this area on the left side, that came from the right brain. So we're already crossed and all of these fibers were supposed to go to the left side of the body. So if the track is crossed out here after it already crossed from the right side, if it's damaged, we don't have it being sent to the left side of the body. So we're having left-sided weakness because it was supposed to just keep going on down to you know wherever it needed to go and we damaged that. And so that means it cannot go down farther to the same side of the body that it's been on. So we basically have symptoms on that same side of the body. Does that make sense? Maybe. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're welcome. Um, if, if you guys are interested in some, at some point, like doing an actual, like looking a little bit more deeply into these tracks and like, actually like look like learning them a little bit better that's something we could do and just make like a case presentation that would kind of more fit that but have more time for for this stuff um but yeah again drawing it out and using diagrams is like really helpful <laughs>